The topic today is all about COVID-19 and the associated actions and attacks on freedoms and rights in Canada. And what about protecting freedom in the freedoms in the courts? So we're going to be talking with uh, two of our guests, uh, quite an animated discussion about the debates that's going on in defense of freedoms and rights in our country. Big topics, big ideas, and practical policy solutions. This is Leaders on the Frontier with your host, David Lees. We know that in Canada, the response to COVID-19 was comprehensive. We had, frankly, attacks on Canadians' rights and freedoms through major lockdowns, the closing of schools, uh, the imposition of many mandates on people. Thousands of persons lost their jobs. We even had uh, places of worship closed um, for uh, Canadians. So these were just many of the actions that the government felt were justified. And some Canadians believe that as well. So today we want to be able to get into uh, some of the legal uh, challenges that are in defense of Canadian uh, freedoms. And why are these actions being undertaken? So we want to explore that today with two of our guests. I want to introduce them. We're delighted to have uh, John Carpe, a lawyer and president and CEO of the Justice Centre. The Centre is a leading advocate in defence of charter rights and freedoms in Canada. We also have Leighton Gray, a senior partner at Gray Wolk Spencer and a leading lawyer undertaking actions against charter violations. Leighton is a senior fellow with Frontier and also is the host of Grey Matter. So welcome, gentlemen. We're glad that you could join us. I'm glad to be with you. Well, look, as we reflect on COVID-19, it's hard to believe that's coming up on some three years ago that uh, we first heard about COVID-19. And many governments acted, uh, frankly, in a state of emergency out of the desire to protect people's health and well-being. Um, they undertook a myriad of actions. Were they justified to protect human health in this way? What's your answer to that? Well, if you're starting with me, I would say no. Uh, it became very clear very early on that COVID-19 was not the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. Uh, the Spanish flu of just over 100 years ago killed uh, at least 1% of the world's population. It actually killed 20 million people at least, possibly 50, some historians say 100 million people, at a time when the world's population was barely a quarter of what it is today. So the COVID numbers, uh, even by April, it was evident we're not dealing with the Spanish flu of 1918. And yet we've had politicians like Jason Kenney publicly compared COVID to the Spanish flu of 1918. Neil Ferguson of Imperial College in London uh, expressly compared COVID to Spanish flu of 1918. False predictions by Neil Ferguson that, that over 500,000 people in the UK would die of COVID. Well, it's you know, okay, so, nothing close to that. So you're saying that the, the whole analogy that this is the, uh, the end time, that this is going to be like the Spanish flu was clearly overstated and therefore the lockdowns were not justified. And that was hence a, a violation of many rights and freedoms. Is that what you're saying, John? That would be the biggest reason. Now, there are other reasons. I mean, even if we even if we were dealing with the Spanish flu of 1918, you still have to ask a bunch of other questions like, do lockdowns work? Are they effective? Is it actually true that there are no treatments or cures, et cetera, et cetera? So there's all these other questions, which I think the, the government would be embarrassed to have to answer. Uh, but the, the, the biggest one right out of the gates is that, that COVID, uh, contrary to what the politicians said, COVID was not uh, the worst pandemic in a century. And so none of these measures were justified. Okay. So what about you, Leighton? What do you think? The answer to your question is yes, this was an unprecedented violation of human rights, not just civil rights, as we thought in the beginning, but human rights, okay. even down to the violation of the integrity of the human body. Wow. So these are... I would, I would surmise that these would be kind of shocking revelations for, for some listeners where they would say, wow, not only was it not on the scale of the, the historic Spanish flu, but also, Leighton, you're suggesting that based on evidence that continues to come out um, out of so many different files, and we'll get to that 
um, mm -hmm. a little bit later is that there's a larger story to be told, in fact, in how this was planned, as you say. Mm -hmm. That's quite uh, a revelation. Yeah, well, I think that um, if you pay attention to, uh, well, I just invite people to go visit the World Economic Forum uh, website and look at their policy page, and then flip over to the Governor of Canada. And if you can see a difference, then you're smarter than I am. Because so uh, you said I had compare the world economic world economic uh, policy page, right? What yes. what their policies are, compare those with the government of Canada, and you'll see that they're virtually identical. In fact, I had uh, Dr. Robert Malone on my podcast recently. Mm -hmm. He described Canada as a world economic forum client state, and wow. of course, the COVID nineteen pandemic is, I in my view, and this is just isn't my view, but it's but I think it's it's the growing view of of people who. Um, are awake to what's going on. The COVID-19 pandemic is part of a broader plan uh, to transform the free world, the Western world, which was a, a, liber, uh, you know, a, a liberal democracies, which had respect for individual rights and freedoms and the ability to self-determine into um, a world in which uh, our every uh, move is charted and, and controlled right down to how we spend money and, uh, what goes into our bodies and everything else that we use to wow. take for granted. So it's a fascinating thesis that you're putting in front of us, a perspective. So I do want to look then more at current legal actions to date. And I know it's mm -hmm. a complex subject and we're not going to be able to go through. Um, we're just kind of scratching the surface here in many respects. But I want to talk specifically from your point of view of brief examples of how Canadians rights and freedoms were violated um, and w then we'll get into some of the more legal cases to watch mm -hmm. and what's happening so um, can you can one of you speak more about the examples of those uh, specific rights and freedoms that have been violated in, in your viewpoint I, I think john's probably in a better position to answer that uh, seeing that he his justice center specializes okay. in that area <laughs> john do you want to go first i'll I will mention that uh, I'll go through some of the charter rights and freedoms and briefly explain how they were violated. Mm -hmm. So charter section 2A protects freedom of conscience and religion, uh, which is the very first freedom that's enumerated in the charter. So in Alberta, we had pastors thrown in prison. Uh, in British Columbia, we had houses of worship closed entirely while bars and gyms, restaurants uh, stayed open. Uh, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, throughout the country, uh, we've had, for example, uh, drive-in church services that have been disrupted, prohibited, banned. So there's been an aggressive attack against the freedom of religion and freedom of conscience uh, extends to uh, a right of every person to decide what gets injected into their body or not. That's obviously been violated by the government mandatory vaccination policies. Um, We've got freedom of expression. Okay, can uh, I just pause there for a sec, John? Because as a layperson, I'm not a lawyer, but I do have some legal background, but it's kind of a common sense view here. You could go to Walmart, you could go to the liquor store, but you couldn't go to your house of worship. Is that where the where it kind of breaks down and says, wait a sec, why is that not a violation of your right to, to frankly worship? Well, this was the case in, in British Columbia for, I believe, about five months where you could have six strangers meet up at a restaurant and six people sit at a table together, but you couldn't have uh, six people or any number of people. Uh, the Justice Centre went to court. We had pastors that were actually willing to comply. In British Columbia, we had pastors that were willing to comply with the hand sanitizer, social distancing, mm -hmm. mask wearing, capacity limits. They said, we'll comply with all that stuff, but let us stay open and the government, in what I think is an, simply anti-religious bigotry on, on the part of Bonnie Henry and nothing else, uh, the government shut down churches entirely. So they didn't have any rationale from a medical point of view to say, no, those can, if you take those kind of precautions like you would in any kind of store, um, you can still remain open. They didn't, did they give any evidence to suggest otherwise? The British Columbia government has not adduced any credible evidence before any court that the houses of worship contributed uh, significantly to the spread of COVID. And of course, that doesn't even go into, you know, COVID's not the Spanish flu of 1918. So right. why, why worry to begin with? But even putting that on the back burner, there's no credible mm -hmm. evidence 
to the effect that the uh, the churches and other houses of worship were serious uh, spreaders of the virus. There's just no evidence. Okay. So what are other uh, rights and freedoms that you think have been, are egregiously violated? So in particular, it's the medical doctors and nurses and healthcare workers who have had their free speech rights significantly violated in the last three years by the colleges of physicians and surgeons or the colleges of nurses or colleges of nurses and midwives. And this is really an attack on science. Science depends on debate and people putting forward their hypotheses and other people criticizing it and having a spirit of humility towards the evidence, analyzing the evidence, mm -hmm. uh, and just having this, this debate go back and forth. That's how science and, and medicine move forward and improve. And what, what's happened in the last three years is that the colleges of physicians and surgeons and the nurses' colleges have stepped in to aggressively censor what doctors and nurses can say and threatening them with a loss of license, which is a threat to lose your livelihood. Wow. And so that's been now other, other people as well, uh, uh, you know, in various ways we've got the federal government and bill C 11 and so on and so forth. There's other threats to free expression as well, but it's been particularly hard on the uh, doctors, nurses and other uh, medical professionals. So, so let me get this straight, John. So ironically, you had healthcare professions within these bodies trying to speak up, perhaps offering a different opinion than the party line of the government, being forbidden to do so. Otherwise, they could do what? Lose their license? Is that really what was happening? Yeah, the the colleges of physicians and surgeons have sent uh, you know mass emails to their doctors saying you must uh, you must teach everybody to be very afraid of COVID, and you you must. Uh, adopt the position that there are no cures or treatments for COVID. You must adopt the position that that lockdowns are really good and they're saving lives. They're not inflicting much harm. You must uh, tell all your patients that they wow. should get vaccinated. You must tell your patients that the vaccine is safe and effective, even if that's not your own view. All of this government narrative, um, we, we recently acted for a nurse in Saskatchewan, Shelley Wilson, uh, she was critical on social media of the government's message on lockdowns and vaccines, got a threatening letter from the college and the Justice Center stepped in and we wrote a letter back and said, you have to re respect the free expression rights, the charter rights of your members. And in that case, the college backed down. But in other cases, the colleges are not backing down and they're moving ahead with disciplinary proceedings wow. against doctors and nurses simply for disagreeing with the government narrative. That's incredible. So this is so ironic, as you say, that it's important to have not only freedom of speech to be able to debate ideas and what's best for a patient, but it, it seems like those bodies with the blessing of the government, of course, is, is inserting itself between the relationship between the patient and the physician. Is that what's going on? That's exactly what's going on. And this is, this is new. This did not happen. Prior to 2020, you had the colleges would enforce ethical standards. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, a doctor should never have sex with one of his patients. Okay. That's a violation of an ethical standard. The college used to deal with ethical violations, uh, but they did not enter into the debate about, you know, for example, I'll give you a real life example of a public debate. Uh, should baby boys be circumcised? Yes or no. Well, that's something that, that doctors and nurses and everybody else can debate, but, Prior to 2020, the college would not have stepped into the debate and said, okay, guys, listen, we're telling you what the truth is. Here's the truth, and you're going to follow it. Uh, the colleges did not do that, but they have been doing exactly that since 2020 by declaring that the, the government's narrative is the truth, and any physician or who publicly disagrees with it uh, risks uh, loss of license to practice medicine. Well, this is, uh, I'm, I'm sure for many Canadians, quite frankly, just dis disturbing to hear this, especially when there's a lot of things that we've learned from COVID-19 as we've uh, looked, you know, we come up on the third anniversary, th th three-year anniversary of this. It's hard to believe. We know a lot of, frankly, a lot of things that they asserted with us. And I think Leighton, you were alluding to this, that they asserted were the truth 
but in fact now have retreated and said, no, that's, that's not true. Like masks are not efficacious. They are mm-hmm. to a small degree, but you know, not really. Mm-hmm. You have all kinds of assertions like the vaccine does not prevent the uh, transmission of the virus. It goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. So does, are you seeing any of these parties back away from their violations and say, you know what, we're sorry. We infringed on your rights wrongly in light of what we know mm-hmm. now. Well, it would be wonderf- wonderful if that were true, but unfortunately, uh, we're not seeing very much of that. Um, hmm. I think people would be shocked to know, for example, in Alberta, that uh, our courts were shut down. Uh, actually, even during a time when the governor of Alberta had re- had removed restrictions on things like masking, uh, our courthouses were the most locked down places uh, in the entire province. In fact, a very senior lawyer named Peter Royal uh, who refused to wear a mask in a courtroom at a time when the mask mandate had been removed in Alberta. Um, he, he refused to wear a mask uh, in the courtroom and he was told by a judge who was wearing a mask uh, that he was in contempt. He was cited in contempt. Oh my. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he had to apologize and purge his contempt before the court because he was simply obeying the law of the land. And so, um, unfortunately, we're, we're not seeing yet institutionally that courts and human rights tribunals and labor tribunals, for example, are adapting themselves to the things that we know about, about the science. A recent example, uh, John will be aware of this uh, one, I think, is a gentleman named Wall, who's an Alberta chiropractor. Uh, he was censured and uh, disciplined by... Uh, his college because he refused to wear a mask. He was convinced that there was no efficacy about the masks, Mm -hmm. which many people knew early on. He refused to use them in his clinic, and this was with the consent of his patients. None of his patients complained, but uh, there was uh, someone else complained. um, I guess we could call him a busybody. And ultimately, he challenged that, and um, he uh, he was censured by... The college the, and, and the college ignored four very eminent world renowned experts people like virologists epidemiologists people like byron bridal testified in that case the the college uh called as their expert uh, someone who's basically a gp who had no expertise in virology epidemiology or anything of that nature and the tribunal actually preferred the evidence of the gp to these renowned experts and mr wall was censured And so uh, what we're seeing actually is that courts and tribunals, decision makers are very, very slow to adapt themselves, what everybody else seems to know. Wow. So it almost seems like they're not doing their job to look into the the current evidence, Mm -hmm. the facts of the matter. Well, I would say uh, that uh, a big part of it, and uh, and some would disagree with this, um, if you just look at the, the approach of our federal government right now. The approach of the federal government is they're still trying to get everybody injected with these vaccinations. And I mean, we could <laughs> dive into that topic uh, in terms of safety and eff- efficacy. Uh, but as far as our, our federal government is concerned, we're still in a pandemic. And I think there's a chill going through all of our, all of our institutions in this country about COVID-19. And I think that's why um, with a few exceptions um, most of the of the tribunals that we've appeared in front of and and the and i follow these cases closely as john does um and we're just not seeing uh courts adapt themselves to the reality of what's going on i'll give you one example um uh, and john knows about this too there's a, a douglas allen report uh from the fraser institute which came out recently and this is a report that we actually uh filed as expert evidence in many of our cases, basically describes, um, you know, COVID-19 lockdown policies as, as the greatest public policy, policy error ever in Canadian history. Uh, and so this is well known. There's a Johns Hopkins study that says the same thing. Uh, there were pastors, uh, Timothy Stevens, who's a gentleman who I had the pleasure of representing uh, as a, uh, on behalf of the Justice Center, uh, was actually arrested and jailed for having an outdoor um, church service. He had already already been chased out of his church uh, because of the restrictions that John talked about. But uh, what, what happened was the government of Alberta used a, used a drone to catch him, as it were, outside having an outdoor church service. And of course, we know uh, because uh, the government's own experts testified about this in Manitoba, 
that there's actually no study anywhere to support the idea that there is a, there's a risk of getting COVID outside. Uh, but, but even so, uh, that, meant, that meant nothing to the court in Manitoba. It meant nothing to the court, uh, other courts. So really, you know, we're sort of, there's a willful blindness that seems to be mm-hmm. going on uh, throughout the system. And it's very, honestly, as a lawyer, somebody who works in the system, it's very, very troubling. And it needs wow. to change. Yeah, it almost seems like a zeal to prosecute people, um, not even, you know, disregarding the evidence of what's really uh, going to be the implications. That's really quite disturbing. I did want to cite a case related to um, our friend, the Honorable Brian Peckford, mm-hmm. among other parties um, involved in, in the whole right to travel. Uh, can you tell us more about that one, John? So Brian Peckford is the uh, former Newfoundland Premier. He is the last living signatory to the charter documents. And so in 2022, which was the 40th anniversary of the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, April 17th uh, being signed, becoming part of our constitution. And so in the 40th anniversary of the charter, we've got an original signatory to the charter suing the federal government over violating the charter You'd think the uh, government-funded media would, uh, you know, take note of that, but uh, receive very little play in the uh, government-funded media. Um, but but Brian Peckford and, and other Canadians sued over the travel restrictions uh, the, in October of 2022 after the government's lawyers and the lawyers for the applicants had spent huge amounts of time and effort and energy and money and we had expert reports and we had cross examinations of of experts on both sides after all of that work went into the case um and after the federal government officials admitted under oath that there's no medical or scientific basis for barring unvaccinated canadians from getting onto airplanes and then the uh the court dismissed the um uh, uh brian peckford's action as moot we're appealing that so what does is, what is moot mean in this context? It means it's no longer relevant. Okay. So, for example, if there were, uh, let's say, a husband and wife are separating, divorcing, and they're fighting over the custody of who's going to have a dog and, that, that they co-own, and then there's a tragic fire and the house burns down and the dog dies in the fire, the court would say that the their action about who owns the dog is now moot because the dog is dead and the court is not going to waste valuable precious resources on a hypothetical philosophical academic question as mm-hmm. to who ought to get the dog when the dog is now dead nobody's getting the dog wow so so that's a proper example of mootness but it's been very highly improper here because the federal government can bring back these travel restrictions at any time on a moment's notice and it's just, it's completely wrong for courts to have all this evidence and then not not make a ruling right. as to whether the restrictions, uh, the travel restrictions against unvaccinated Canadians, whether they were valid or not. Yeah. When all the evidence is in, it's right. just, uh, it's uncomfortable. Because the, the facts are that their travel rights were, were violated. Yeah. Right. They couldn't see family. They couldn't see friends. And meanwhile... Life has moved on. We're all traveling now. And so the judge says, I'm just going to wash my hands of this and, and call it moot. Is that right? That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Wow. That's that's shocking. So in that particular case, is there hope then? Uh, where where is that going to some kind of appeal or where where is it going? So it's before the Federal Court of Appeal. Uh, we hope to persuade the Federal Court of Appeal that this is unjust. All the evidence is there. Uh, the trial judge should just make a decision. Even if we don't win this appeal, we have a situation where we had federal government officials admit under oath that there's no medical or scientific basis for these policies to bar the unvaccinated from getting onto airplanes. That's a huge victory. Apart from the court action, we would never be able to hold the government to account. The governments don't have hard evidence when they come into court. And so we need these court actions to expose that fact. Be sure to stay tuned for our next episode as we talk about how do we protect those rights and freedoms for the sake of our nation. And in the meantime, be sure to follow us on social media and on our website. 
thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.